everyone. I am Rachel with the Progressive Change uh, Campaign Committee. I hope everyone is um, doing okay in these uh, very, very tough uh, days. I know there's a, a lot going on um, at home and, and abroad. So we so appreciate you taking the time, um, whether you're joining us from California or New York um, or Rhode Island or Nebraska and South Dakota, welcome, uh, welcome to all and thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, so we are thrilled to be joined uh, uh, by, uh, with David Segal, uh, Siegel tonight running for Congress in Rhode Island's second uh, uh, district. Um, we uh, purposefully don't charge a fee uh, for these events. We think it's really important that you get to hear uh, from the candidate first and ask your questions. Uh, and, and if you agree, and if you feel inspired, uh, then we hope that you'll, you'll chip in to, to David's uh, campaign. Um, when you have a question, please feel free to drop it into the chat box at any point. Uh, my colleague Nick will be monitoring the chat box. We will get to as many as we, as we possibly can. Um, so bear, please bear with me. Um, and he'll give you a heads up when we're, when we're coming your, your way. Um, so, and lastly, before we, 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 dig, we dig in, uh, we have been doing something new. It's maybe not so new anymore because we've been doing it uh, for a few uh, of these events, um, but to make it feel like we're a little, like we're kind of in person together a little bit more or build a little bit more sense of a community. Um, we would love if you would unmute yourself quickly um, and say hello to each other and say hello to David and then please quickly mute yourself back. But folks, let's all say hi. Hi to David and each other, please. Hi, David. Hi, hi David. David. Hi, David. Hi, David. Thank you, hi. <laughs> thank you, folks, that was great. Thank you, thank you. Um, all right, so folks, let's go ahead and dig in. I'm gonna kick it over to our fabulous co-founder, Dr. Stephanie Taylor, to share a few words. Stephanie? Thank you, Rachel, and, and thank you, everybody, for joining our call tonight. Um, before we start tonight, I wanted to take a moment to think about the children and teachers of Uvalde, Texas. Um, I know that massacre has affected many of us very, very deeply, myself included. And I hope that this conversation, thinking about new courageous leadership in Congress, will give some respite to the despair that so many of us are feeling right now. And for our Meet the Candidates call tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce David Siegel, who's running in Rhode Island's second congressional district. This seat is a blue seat that is open due to Congressman Jim Langevin's retirement. And David is a former Rhode Island state representative, and he's the founder and executive director of Demand Progress. And Demand Progress, for anyone who doesn't know, is an advocacy group that works on issues like fighting monopolies and defending our democracy. And we've worked closely with David and Demand Progress for a decade. And we know that David understands the levers of power in DC. He understands how to maneuver within Congress and also mobilize grassroots activists outside of Congress together to get things done. And here at the Progressive Change Campaign Committee, we always say we need more organizers in Congress, people who will be strategic about building relationships and actively looking for opportunities to push forward progressive priorities every day. And I have no doubt that David would be one of those organizer members. So I look forward to your questions today and I'm sure he's looking forward to answering them. So with that, let me give a very warm welcome to David and turn things over to him for his remarks. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so I'm running for Congress on the basic proposition that I think you know, everybody in this uh, Zoom today agrees with that the government should be able to do more for people. And people are frustrated that issues that have been with us in some cases for decades or in some cases far longer have largely gone unaddressed. And I'm talking about you know, bread and butter issues that you know, groups like PCCC have been working on, ensuring an economy that works for everybody, securing genuinely universal access to high quality healthcare, 
and accelerating the transition to a renewable energy economy that helps protect the environment and creates high road union jobs in the process. It means that we won't have to deal with you know, gas price based inflation ever again, five or 10 years from now. And I think that when we talk about these and other important issues, we need for voters to be able to trust that we're actually going to do something about them. And for the last 20 years, I've been able to help build coalitions uh, with you know, P-TRIP at times and with others who I've already noticed are in this chat today. So thank you all that are capable of overcoming corporate influence and other special interest influence uh, and can make government do more for people. And I'm running on a record of 20 years of work, you know, four years as a member of the city council in Providence, four years as a state representative in Rhode Island, where among other things, I was a co-organizer of our progressive caucus and 10 years or so of running demand progress um, on leave at the moment. Um, but throughout, I've been able to work on a variety of issues that were relevant then, still relevant today and make progress uh, despite at times having a Republican governor or a conservative uh, legislature leadership, um, talking about issues like you know, immigration reform or uh, pushing back against corporate power or advocating successfully for more progressive taxation, expanding renewable energy generation, criminal justice reform. And over the course of the last 10 years, I've been able to help mobilize literally millions of people and hundreds of organizations and small businesses in support of important causes like guarding consumers and small businesses and workers against the power of corporate monopolies and elevating diplomacy in our foreign policy and pushing it back against our tendency to become embroiled in disastrous foreign conflicts. And you know, all the way, I have found that when we can find points of commonality, sometimes across people of very differing backgrounds and even different ideologies, we're capable of building coalitions that can overcome those corporate interests and special interests and make government do things that help everyday people. And I know there's an appetite for that kind of campaign and that kind of candidate in Rhode Island. Uh, this is a district that Bernie won overwhelmingly in 2016. It was 57, 43, something like that. And Bernie and Elizabeth together were on pace to win it in early uh, 2020. And we've been finding that you know, as we knock on more doors, as we make more phone calls, as we do you know, mailings to tens of thousands of people, as I make media appearances, the more that people know about me and about this campaign, the more likely they are to support us. We're squarely now in second place in what is a six-way race. And we're just getting started. Our primary is not until almost four months from now. And so your presence tonight and your willingness to help this campaign and help us get word out are incredibly vital because the way that we'll win is by making sure that everybody in the district has an opportunity to hear what we stand for. Thank you. Um, great. Thank you so much, uh, David. So we have some questions um, rolling in, but I want to kick things um, off with, you know, where I think a lot of our, our heads are at. Um, what, uh, you know, how do we stop the massacres of, of innocent folks um, and elderly folks and children um, in Texas and Buffalo and California? Uh, what can you share with us? I think, you know, I, I, of course, support an assault weapons ban. I support closing, you know, loopholes um, in you know, our current you know, background check regimes. Um, I don't want to pretend that's going to be easy. And, you know, some of these matters haven't even come before a vote in the House, which is controlled by Democrats, you know, for various reasons um, related to the, the politics of the matter. Um, I also have spent much of the last you know, five years working on trying to augment the business models that you know, big tech uh, uses and you know, they their models are fundamentally you know, poisonous and you know, purvey polarization they elevate the most incendiary and hateful content because they try to keep us addicted and clicking on their materials so that we can see more and more ads and unfortunately it's that content that's most incendiary most polarizing most turns us against one another that is best for them from a basic business standpoint. And so I think we'll talk about this more later, but a lot of the anti-monopoly policy that I've been working on, especially as applied to big tech, I hope would help make it less likely that we uh, encounter these tragedies moving forward. 
Thank you. Okay, up next, uh, we're gonna go to uh, Peggy. Uh, Miss Peggy, and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, Peggy Samas. Uh, Peggy, can you please go ahead and unmute yourself? And will you please share with folks, where are you joining us from? And ask uh, David your question, please. Um, well, thank you for having me on. Of course. Um, <laughs> and I don't care how you pronounce my name. <laughs> it's uh, um, my question, which kind of seems lame right now because of all the stuff that's going on to people, children, and in these mass shootings. And I'm I'm for gun control, but my question was that we've heard a lot about it. Why? Uh, or are they going to do something and make people that are the uh, uh, rich people of America start paying taxes? I mean, I pay a lot of taxes. I don't make that much money. Uh, I'm okay with paying taxes. I want to see people be helped with those taxes. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, if they can go to outer space and they can they use people like us to make those that money then why can't we benefit mm -hmm. and i i think that there, there are a broad number of proposals i support that would entail ensuring the taxes are paid you know increasingly by people who can afford to pay them um, and it's something that i've worked on in rhode island over the years we were able to make some advances unfortunately as a function of the last economic crisis when our, our budget was so wrecked by the, the housing and financial crisis that we needed to find new revenue somewhere, we were able to uh, elevate the capital gains tax in Rhode Island and ensure that higher earners were paying more money through um, through that mechanism. Um, but these are hard issues and we you know, see Manchin and Cinema uh, blocking progress on these and other matters on the Senate side. By no means is every Democrat in the House on board with such a program. I think you know, aspects of higher taxes are salient right now because of the inflation that we're encountering and the extent to which it's being driven by corporate profits. Again, goes back to you know, matters of monopoly and the pricing power that we've afforded these companies. But there are several bicameral proposals in now to tax you know, windfall profits away from companies that are exploiting this moment to increase their profits, which they're then mostly redistributing to uh, their shareholders as dividends or through buybacks rather than putting into productive uh, capacity. Um, and I support all of these measures. And I think the way that we get to the point where we eventually pass them is by electing better people. Um, there's not an easy answer to it. Peggy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the question, David. Thank you for the response. Okay, up next, folks, we are going to keep it rolling. We're going to go to uh, Lauren Nidell. Uh, Lauren, can you please unmute yourself and uh, share with folks where you're joining us from, uh, where you're joining us from, and um, and please go ahead and, and ask David your question. Hey, David, good to see you again. Good to see you. Um, so in Rhode Island, we have a very dysfunctional de Democratic Party. Um, it's basically made up of probably 50 to 60 percent blue dogs. It's not trusted, as is the case in many other states. How do we bring minorities, disenfranchised people, people that have given up on the system because of the lack of trust and the lack of um, accountability. How do we bring them into the campaign, get them energized and supporting you? And thank you for the question. I mean, I, I, I don't wanna to presume to know what will inspire any particular person, especially somebody who comes from a background very different from mine to support the campaign. I mean, I've worked on, but I will say I mean, I've worked on a number of you know, racial justice issues over the years. When I first ran for office for the city council in 2002, it was on a, uh, a sort of dual platform of elevating wages for city workers. Uh, we were pushing for a, a living wage for people who work for the city disproportionately would have impacted um, the Latino community in Providence. At that time, a living wage was considered 10, 10, $10, 10 cents an hour. Um, and also um, on police oversight. And so you know, racial justice uh, has, is literally in meaningful part what got me into politics. 
Um, in terms of you know, disenfranchised voters or people who are not participating in the system, generally speaking, I, mean, I think that people want politicians who have a history of standing up for people, generally speaking, and against interests that do not have the public interest in mind. And that's what I've done throughout my career. And whether we're talking about pushing back um, against corporate power at the city level, you're know, trying to make sure that uh, entities that got tax breaks had to provide housing access or local jobs, or we're talking about pushing for higher taxes on wealthier earners, or over the course of the last 10 years, pushing back against monopoly power, trying to ensure that you know, regulators uh, across the agencies that have oversight over corporate power are people who have public interest backgrounds and not people who've you know, flown through the revolving door, you know, 15 times and made millions of dollars while doing so. That's what I've always stood for. And so when we hear from voters, and it's not an unusual occurrence when we're on the phones or doing peer-to-peer -peer texts, somebody says, you know, I've given up on the system. Um, why, why should I even you know, take part in this election? And we talk to them about that history. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to, I don't want to pretend it works every single time, but a lot of people are actually taken by it and do seem to understand that I come from a different vantage than standard fair politicians that I've been doing this work for a long time. And I think that makes a difference. Oops, I was on mute. Sorry, folks. Uh, Lauren, thank you so much for the for the question. Okay, up next, folks, we're gonna go to uh, Castle uh, Weinstein. Uh, Mr. Weinstein, can you please share with us all where you're calling in from? And uh, what's your question for, for David, sir? Hi, so I, I follow a lot of different races. I'm calling from California. Um, and I like being informed of who we're looking at. And I belong to a uh, Democratic club and I like informing them of who I like and who we support. My question is, I like a, my, well, my statement, first of all, is that I like a lot of your, your things you're going for. I like breaking up the monopolies. I like going after the higher taxes for pe for the wealthier income. What are your feelings on APAC? I will say I support a, you know, I, I, I went to, I went to Jewish day school and um, you have a, have a strong um, background uh, in Judaism from a religious standpoint and a social standpoint. Um, I support a two state solution and I support, um, preventing further expansions of settlements and annexation. And you know, so I'll speak to the policy positions, but those are on my website and what I've stood for for some time. That's good. I, it scared me because a lot of progressives are not on the same page as you. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And thank you. Thank you for, uh, for the question. Okay, so David, I'm going to bring in some folks uh, on um, from Facebook too, uh, and bring them into the conversation. So Tara uh, G from uh, New York, uh, her question is: What are your plans to protect our reproductive rights in Congress? So I would, of course, support codification of Roe v. Wade. It's something that I worked on at the state level back when I first got elected. Some of this goes to what Lauren was speaking to earlier. We, we've had over the years uh, a very conservative, um, even, even though Democratic, Democrat you know, dominated General Assembly in Rhode Island. And in 07, 08, when I first got elected, I was one of four or five people who co-sponsored legislation to codify Roe v. Wade at the local level or the state level. Um, and I think that it, there, there were there were probably other were other people in the chamber who would have supported the legislation. I think it was a mix of there being a conservative and probably anti-choice majority and also the issue not seeming as salient yet uh, because it wasn't under you know, as immediate threat at the national level as it's now you know, been made clear that it is. Um, but it was a small group of us who were working on these concerns back then. I also you know, supported legislation to ensure that more people who were on you know, Medicaid, for instance, could access abortion. Um, and over the course of the ensuing years, I've been able to be part of a movement that eventually came to codify Roe in 2019, uh, working through you know, the Working Families Party that I helped co-found and helping people get elected and so on. And the assembly's changed quite a bit um, since then. Um, so in Rhode Island right now, we are 
thankfully, at least for the time being, protected. Of course, I think we need to be concerned about what might happen over coming years if Republicans gain control of the House and Senate and presidency or you know, further attacks by the Supreme Court even. Um, at the federal level, I you know, would support codification. I would, uh, you know, I, I'm opposed to the Hyde Amendment. I think that you know, people who are recipients of, uh, of you know, funds through public programs you know, should be able to access abortion care. Um, and I think we need to look at court reforms uh, because of this issue and more generally. And this is you know, but one issue where our courts are drastically out of touch with where the American people are. Uh, and it, it's true of, uh, on all of the corporate out power uh, matters we've been talking about over the course of the evening. Um, they've been making it harder and harder for us to regulate corporate power and look like they're going to attack the administrative state that I've been working to try to ensure is populated with people who care about the public interest. And this has been a priority for P-TRIP and for Elizabeth Warren and so many others. And so because of this issue and so many others, we need reform. Thank you. Uh, so up next, uh, we have our, our friend here, Toby, uh, Ms. Toby Frost. Uh, Toby, you submitted uh, a question. I would like to see if you'd like to ask uh, David your, your question. Uh, if so, would you like to go ahead and unmute yourself? and ask uh, David your question, please. Toby Frost. I've, Hi. Never, I've never said anything on one of these, so. Uh, well, first time for everything, right? <laughs> I, I wanted to find out who David Siegel was and everything I'm hearing makes it better and better. <laughs> um, I, live in, I live in Massachusetts, about 15 miles west of Boston. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a senior, senior citizen. I notice that all, most of you people are kind of young, and I like that because I wish that I saw more young people on these these uh, um, you know these zooms. But anyway, um, more power to you. It's sounding better and better. And um, I don't have a question yet. I just I may Thank not have know. a question until the end of the week, but <laughs> um, I just want, I'm happy for the chance to tell you how much I appreciate what I'm hearing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Toby. Uh, thank you for, um, thank you for joining us. So up next, uh, we're going to bring in someone from, from Facebook. Um, so David, um, uh, Catherine would like to know, um, how can we ensure the Democrats win this year's midterms. I fear the party will be blamed for the recession being predicted. Uh, it it is an important question, of course. I yeah, I, I think that I was very hopeful going into the Biden administration, even though I you know I identified as more progressive than him in the primaries. I thought that he the agenda that he was talking about, say during his you know DNC speech, I thought did a pretty good job of synthesizing elements of the progressive platform into it. And we were able to, through organizing, get a number of really solid you know, regulators into the administration. And I you know, support the Build Back Better framework, for instance. Um, I, I think that we are unfortunately falling prey to this sort of unwinding um, where, you know, Manchin and Cinema and some other recalcitrant Democrats have blocked the agenda and that you know disempowers us from doing good things and we look weaker and the administration relative to the good things that it wants to do looks weaker um and we end up in this you know vicious cycle and i'm very worried um i think that on the campaign trail the issue that seems to matter most and I, i've spoken to this at almost every question i've answered is concern about corporate power has ubiquitous um there's ubiquitous concern about corporate power across ideological uh, tendencies across you know, parties. And I see this in the work that I've done over the course of the last 10 years. We have these you know, bipartisan formations, even in Congress, even inclusive of elected officials um, who support doing more to push back against corporate consolidation. And that's even more pervasive on the ground. You know, in Congress, like when we try to move a bill forward around breaking up big tech, for instance, we have maybe 90% of the people who support it are Democrats and 10% are Republicans, but we need those Republicans to get the bills through because not every you know, Democrat is, is good on these issues. On the ground, 
vastly many more Republicans and independents agree that corporations have too much power across all of these different sectors from tech to what we're seeing around you know, baby formula now. I mean, what, what an incredibly stark crisis for people to have to confront, like literally not being able to be certain that they can feed their babies. And this is a function of three companies dominating the baby formula market. And one of them, which I think had a 43% share having a contamination issue that was allowed to fester for too long because it had captured its regulator. And so people understand these issues. And I think it's one of those moments where, you know, though imperfect, the Biden administration has an agenda that it can speak to as a program that it can speak to by virtue of the regulators that it's put in place and some of the policies that it supported. I hope that we see action on some of the tech antitrust bills soon. Senator Schumer is saying that some of them will come for a vote on the floor of the Senate over the course of the next month or so. Um, I pray that happens because the issues themselves are so important and because these issues are so salient to the electorate and they provide an opportunity for Democrats to actually demonstrate that they're willing to uh, back up their rhetoric with action. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, David. And then you know you mentioned some of some of this, um, but you know, could you share a little bit more on um, your thoughts on net neutrality? Oh, sure. Uh, net neut <laughs> I see Adam put that in the chat. <laughs> um, it's sort of a, a softball or maybe a troll. I can't quite tell, but I appreciate but important, it. But uh, important, right? <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, Adam's one of the people who um, really helped. And, and, and Petra will see more generally in my, in my, my co-founder of uh, Demand Progress, Aaron Swartz, who's unfortunately no longer with, with us, um, were among the folks who got net neutrality on the agenda um, 12 years ago, I guess a little bit before that now, 12, 13, 14 years ago. And th this is another monopoly you know, power question. Um, and it, it, in some ways, it's what transitioned me into somebody who thinks about monopoly power. It, it's the question of whether or not I, the ISPs, the cable companies, as opposed to the platforms, as opposed to face, you know, Comcast, as opposed to Facebook and, and Google, can decide to elevate certain content and deprioritize other content based on political preference or whether the purveyors of that content are paying them to do so. And just a, you know, another moment where we see content flows manipulated in service of private profit and we all came together. Um, at times, there have even been some more you know, conservative-leaning people in these coalitions to help uh, push the Federal Communications Commission in 2014, 2015 to adopt strong net neutrality rules. Unfortunately, when Trump came in, he saw them overturned pretty quickly. And we're now awaiting the confirmation of a fifth FCC commissioner, a third Democrat that would give Democrats the majority on the FCC and mean that we can push this forward again through the regulatory state. And I think it's an incredibly important issue and I'm hopeful that it's one that we'll all get to work on together over the course of coming months. Thank you, David. I am gonna kick it back over to Stephanie Taylor for one final uh, question. Stephanie? Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for these great questions. Thank you, David, for your thoughtful answers. Um, David is getting his campaign off the ground and every dollar is helpful right now. So please consider chipping in what you can. And speaking of which, David, can you leave us with a few thoughts about why folks should invest in this race and how these early dollars will help build your campaign and why they're so critical, especially in these, these early months? Yeah, ab absolutely. Thank you, Stephanie. So we're, 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 I think, the last primary in the country. It's a September 13th primary, so we have almost four months to go. And I just announced, um, I don't know, about a month ago. Uh, and, and then things have gone you know, tremendously since. Elizabeth Warren endorsed right away, the communications workers, PCCC, a number of you know, WFP, RREV, a number of other organizations. And we are you know, building a foundation for the long haul. haul. And, and as I said at the top, the more that people learn about where I stand on these issues, the more they support me. And that, that's clear to us now from even you know, quantitative data that we have, uh, but it's also clear from you know, scores or hundreds of anecdotes at the doors and on the phones. And given the system that we live in, you know, your, your dollars enable that. We, we need private dollars in order to run campaigns. I wish that we could make that otherwise, and perhaps one day we can. Um, and also your help on the phones and through other tools we'll be using, uh, you know, peer-to-peer -to -peer texting and so on, mean that we can get the message out. 
And you know, as I said, as we get the message out, people move in our direction in a really serious way. And if we can do it at scale, then we can win this thing. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, David. Uh, folks, I, I think you can see why um, why David needs to be, be in Congress. So help us send him uh, there. Um, uh, if you've chipped in before, and if you can chip in again, um, if you have friends, ask them to chip in. Um, if this is your first time chipping in and you're inspired by what you heard, please consider chipping in. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. There's a lot happening um, here in the world. So thank you for taking the time, uh, sharing your time with us uh, and David. Thank you. And folks, let's let's close this out how we started it. Folks, unmute yourself. Let's all let's all give a big go, David. And thank you to David. And thank you to everyone. And hi to each other. <laughs> go, David. All right. Thanks. Thank nice to my Toby. Nice to meet you. Thanks, folks. Take care. Thank Good night. You. Bye, everyone. <laughs>